In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. I was reading a funny article the other day that talked about if the world was coming to an end, what would the headlines look like in some of the major publications? So in Rolling Stone it said, Grateful Dead announces reunion tour. <laughs> Sports Illustrated, the headline reads, just game over. And my personal favorite, because I'm not necessarily like a music person, but my personal favorite was from Men's Health Magazine saying, lose 10 pounds before the apocalypse. <laughs> But it gives us a little bit of insight about how we as human beings perceive the end of the world. Think about every movie that we watch, every book that we read, everything around us that talks about the end of the world being something scary and foreboding and something that we absolutely do not want to arrive. And as a result, we're constantly filled with fear. And you know, if the church isn't careful, it could end up falling into the same trap. Because these readings that we're going to have throughout Advent talk about some scary times ahead. It talks about the coming of the Son of Man, the coming of Jesus Christ in glory, but it doesn't come without some cost. It doesn't come without some trial. I mean, even today, it talks about signs in the sun, the moon and the stars, and on the earth, distress among the nations, and that the heavens themselves will be shaken. That doesn't sound very pleasing or something that we might want to welcome. But at the same time, though, we're not called to live in fear. Because those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ don't have any reason to be afraid. Actually, quite the opposite. We're called to rejoice. That's why Jesus says right there in the scripture, when you see these things begin to take place, stand up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. So the question is, how do we move from this idea of being afraid to this idea of being rejoicing? And I think it has everything to do with the difference between anticipation and dread. And I think we have a good idea of what those two kind of feelings are, but let me just give you an example from my childhood. My parents sometimes work different work schedules, and occasionally my mother would have to work late. And so the times when I knew my mother was cooking was great anticipation, because I could probably get my favorite meal, or even like a steak or something. I mean, mom is a good cook. On the other hand, when I heard that my father was going to cook, I might have associated that with some dread. <laughs> because dad occasionally cooks some strange things, like salted codfish, which no 10-year-old wants to eat. <laughs> or the time that he said, I'm going to introduce you to beef tripe. <laughs> no. <laughs> so anticipation versus dread. And so what I'm here to talk about this morning is that as Christians, we are not to face the second coming of Jesus Christ with dread, but rather with anticipation. And there's two things that I really want us to focus on these next three weeks. The first is preparation. We're going to talk a lot about preparation in the next three weeks as we get ready for Christmas. But even that word preparation is so loaded, isn't it? When I said the word preparation, some of you probably thought, hurricane, I'm getting ready for a hurricane. Or I'm getting ready for a, a medical procedure that I don't want to do. Or I'm getting ready for something else that I may not like. 
that connotation of the word preparation can be so negative sometimes. But when I think of preparation, I think a lot of when my family is going to come visit my home during the Christmas holiday. Now, if you can imagine, Father Alex has two children who he loves very much, but who him, along with the rest of his family, cause a tremendous amount of chaos in our home. And so when it's time for family to arrive, we spend the week before cleaning a lot. <laughs> Toys have to be put away, beds have to be made, things have to be reorganized, recycling is taken out, and at the end of the process, you can eat off of that floor until everybody in the family leaves and we just revert back to chaos. <laughs> but that preparation is not easy, but it is joyful, and it's done joyfully because we know that preparation is leading somewhere. It's leading towards hospitality. It's leading towards welcoming people you may not have seen in a while. And so the preparation is anticipation and not dread. How are our souls doing this time of year in preparation? Are there some things that have to be cleaned out? Some things that have to be reorganized in the home right here in our heart? How is my relationship with God? Are we on a regular conversational basis? Or has it been a while since we last had a serious conversation? How's my worship life? Do I approach worship joyfully or dread? Over the next three weeks, this is the time that we have as Christians called Advent where we can sit down and really engage in some of that serious discussion with God. Lord, what are you preparing me for in your kingdom? And how have I been or not been preparing for your kingdom to be on earth? The second thing that we should be doing is something I mentioned at the beginning of the sermon, which is rejoice. I know and am aware fully that the holiday season can be very trying on families. It can be very hard on people, especially those who've lost loved ones. So hearing rejoice can be especially difficult this time of year. But my belief is this, why should we let the secular culture have all the fun? The secular culture has seriously commercialized this holiday to the point that, you know, Two weeks after Christmas, you'll be able to start buying Christmas stuff again. And I will admit, grudgingly, I may or may not have been called a Grinch a few times in my life because I'm that Episcopalian that says, don't put anything up until the week before Christmas or things like that. And I'm already getting the glaring looks from over there. But I've changed all that. My belief is, put it all up. As many lights as you want. You have a Christmas tree? Get it on up there. Rejoice. Show as much as we can about why this season should be happy. But don't do it for the way the rest of the world is doing it. Do it for the reason about why we should really be happy. Because you see, the world in which we live, we know it's broken. We know it is not the way it should be. And the only thing that will cure it is the coming of Christ. And so instead of feeling anxious or worrying about that coming, we can show people exactly why they should be happy. And so maybe in that way we can actually reclaim what Christmas is all about. So I'll end with, with this kind of image that I, I was asked to explain what the second coming of Jesus is like if you're not expecting it. And I remember uh, working in the hospital as a hospital chaplain, and a gentleman came in with a broken leg. And the, the doctor said, now you understand something here. We're going to have to reset this leg. It's not the way it should be, but it's going to hurt when I do it. And the guy was like, I understand that, but 
can we think of something else? <laughs> and he says, listen, don't worry, okay? It'll hurt for a moment. We'll put a cast on it. Six weeks later, you'll be as good as new. Okay, so I'm going to do it on three. One, two, right there. It's going to come that quickly. It's going to come that quickly. And that's why Christ wants us to be prepared. He wants us to be ready because we're not going to expect it. But what we can expect is that if we truly believe in Him and have placed our trust in Him, that that moment that we do see Him will be anticipation and joy. Amen. Amen.